also got technical support, uh, which hopefully will be working for us. Ah, excellent. Um, I'll come to the photograph in one moment, um, but let me just say my name is David Jacobs. I know some of you, of course, and you know, you know me, but I was born and bred in Manchester. Um, uh, and I subsequently retired from the Reformed Synagogues in 2014, where one of my pieces of work was working with small communities. Um, but I also, I think today, term is I have a bit of a portfolio to uh, enlighten you with, that I belong to a very small group of people who were founders of Jewish museums. Uh, I started the Museum of the Jewish East End in 1983. And I've been involved in aspects of work of small communities with the Jewish Historical Association of South Wales, and we welcome Stanley Soffer, who's very much involved in that. I think we've got Hilary Thomas here, uh, who's involved in St Anne's, and we are going to hear from the people from Cumbria. Um, let me just explain why I put this photograph up. Um, this was taken in Cumbria in 1948. This is a group of 71 young men and women immediately after the war at Outgate. You can't quite read it, but it says Outgate Post Office. Um, and it was a group of young adults who came together for a weekend around Shavuot time, around May, June time in that year, um, to be enlightened by uh, people like Jacob Petakovsky, the Bible scholar, and that's his wife. And this gentleman here, if you cast your mind back a few years, was ejected from the Labour Party conference for heckling Jack Straw. That's the late Walter Wolfgang. And lastly, that's my dad, um, my late father. Uh, we went to visit this shortly after his wife and my mum died, uh, 2002, and we stood there. I didn't need to sit on this roof. This is the WI building in Outgate near Hawkshead in Cumbria. Um, but he did, or she did, we don't know who the photographer was, um, to take this wonderful photograph of 71 people. Um, and we brought together men, those who survived in 2008 to mark the 60th anniversary of the taking of the photo. So ladies and gentlemen, um, let's move on to our programme this evening. Uh, Travellers Tales from Cumbria, um, Dr. Trish Skinner will speak on behalf of Lisa Novenstern um, from Connecting Small Communities. Um, so let me just say a few words about Trish. Uh, Trish was formerly a professor in history at Swansea University and co-devised the Connecting Small Histories project for which she has worked on a voluntary basis since retiring in 2020. She's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and of the Learned Society of Wales. Lisa Novenstern is project researcher for Cumbria. Relocating to Birmingham from Israel only two years ago, Lisa felt that engaging with local history was a good opportunity to feel at home in this new environment. So uh, Trish, we look forward to hearing from you when you are ready or when Lovely. we're ready. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you everyone for coming this evening. By way of introduction, um, I'm, I'd like to note that this segment is based on research that Lisa and I have been doing very much from afar. Um, the dream trip to Cumbria is still something that is still a dream. And it looks like there are gonna be lots of post project trips once we all get released. Um, but in a strange way, we've been transported there by the stories that we've discovered. We've added them to a Google map that's now publicly available online and to which I will now have to uh, obviously um, add Hawkshead. Um, here's a little sneaky preview of it, but um, it is available through the, um, the Heritage Hub on the JSCM website. And I hope you'll go and play with it because it, um, I didn't want to sort of uh, play with it this evening and then actually um, not talk about some of the stories. Tonight I'm going to talk about three stories and bring you three stories, Lisa's own, because working on this project is a, a journey in itself. Sophie's story, as told by her daughter, and then Jeremy's story, 
which he has kindly recorded for us in his own words from home in Israel. And I'll play that at the end of this presentation. Firstly, let's set the scene. Cumbria in northwest England is, of course, well known for its beautiful countryside and lakes interspersed with picturesque towns and has major centres in Carlisle in the north, whose hidden Jewish history, of course, includes the Bon Motza Company, and Barrow in Furness in the south, with a small Jewish community of its own, which shaped the retail profile of that town and, of course, about which David knows uh, uh, quite a lot more than I do. One of our stories ends up in Barrow, but our focus was on Windermere and on Penrith and Appleby. Let me tell you a little bit about Lisa's story. Lisa wanted me to um, tell you a little bit about this because she trained as a medical lab assistant in Germany and discovered her love for Israel in the late 1980s, moving there in 1990. Whilst raising a family there, she took a BA in Judaic studies and further family relocations and demands meant that she didn't manage to pursue her, her love of Judaic studies. And so coming to this project has, has been picking up um, a thread that, that, that she had actually put down. She didn't pursue a career path in that area, but now living in England, she is retrained as both a carer and a language assistant. Discussing what she wanted to explore on the project, her interests, of course, took in migration and the challenges of living uh, as somebody from outside in a place where Jewish life was not highly visible. Many of the stories she's uncovered remind her of her own childhood, where Jewish life was rare. Some stories that she discovered featured refugees who came to Cumbria briefly from persecution in Nazi Germany, but then moved on to other larger cities in the UK and elsewhere. You may, of course, be familiar with the story of the Windermere Boys, now made into a BBC film. But did you know, and this is where we start our, our next story, that there were also Windermere Girls? Sophie's story. Lynn G told Lisa all about the story of her mother, Sophie Goldschmidt, who had arrived on the kinder transport aged 11 and was initially sent to a girls hostel in Newcastle upon Tyne. When the docks and the shipyards at Newcastle were designated a defence zone and were therefore not thought to be safe, the girls were moved to a house in Windermere named Southwood. The eight youngest girls were kept together the eight, eldest, the, the eight eldest were kept together, and that left the middle four, as Sophie called them, Sophie, Elfie, Ruth and Liesel, who became firm friends and shared a room for the six years of the war. All of the girls had duties in the hostel. They would take an old sheet to the hill behind the house and collect firewood. For, Sophie would take the bicycle belonging to the hostel into the village for food. There was cleaning and washing, and they all went to school and learned English. All the time, they were hoping for news from home. Were their parents still alive? Life in the hostel wasn't easy. The matrons had previously only looked after boys, and now they were responsible for 20 girls. Money was always short. Birthdays were important and were celebrated with a cake, and the girl in question was allowed to choose what they had um, for supper. Sophie was regularly in trouble. The large tree in the middle of the front lawn became her hiding place. The children went to local schools and teachers gave up their free time to give them extra coaching. The vicar called on them and, their, and befriended them to the day they left. Shopkeepers, police and doctors were kind and helpful despite the fact that they were Germans speaking German and Britain was at war with Germany. All of the children left the hostel after the war with skills. Some trained as dressmakers, hairdressers, nurses and teachers. Liesel became a librarian. During those six years, Sophie learned that her mother and father had both died. Liesel was luckier. Her father came out of Austria and her mother survived the camps, although she was never well. They met up again in Israel after the war. Elfie and Ruth stayed on in Britain and are still enjoying their lives here with their own families. The girls talk with undying gratitude for the sustained devotion of the committee who rescued them and the Jewish communities of the Northeast and of Cumbria who welcomed them. 
Sophie was the last to leave the hostel in 1946. She was still too young to start nursing, but the local doctor took her in and she started training. She, lost, she left the hostel, taking with her the very useful bicycle. In 1947, she met Reg, born Abraham, known as Sonny to the family and Reg to his RAF friends. They met in the hospital at a circumcision party. Sonny had lost the toss of a coin to go and had to attend, and there he fell for Sophie. They married on Christmas Day, 1947. Sonny's mother, Sophie's, Sophie recalled, was against the union. After all, Sophie was a nobody, no family and no money. Even walking down the aisle, she was told she could still change her mind, but they were together for over 60 years and had two children. About 10 years after the end of the war, Sophie became a British citizen. It was a day out in Liverpool and very important to her and her family. They lived in Barrow in Furness, where Sophie became very involved in community life, always wanting to put something back. She seldom talked about the past, but looked towards the future. She learned that she was the sole survivor of her family. She and Sonny learned to run the family business, dealing in fabric, and made a success of it. She knew most of the people in Barrow, mainly because they came to the shop to buy fabric for dresses, then for wedding dresses, and then for curtains for the new house. Sophie never finished her nursing training, but was part of the voluntary service at the General Hospital in Barrow for over 30 years, manning a desk in the front entrance hall. People talked to her and she knew their complaints and no one had to queue for batteries for hearing aids because she had a draw full. On retirement, she gave talks on Jewish life and tried to ensure people understood that Jewish or Christian, people were simply people. She never went to these talks empty handed. She took honey cakes and other traditional foods. She was proud to be British and thought the UK was the best place in the world to live. Sonny lived until he was 85 and Sophie died at the same age in 2014. Alongside children from the kinder transport, Cumbria also became a temporary home for others from the Tyne and Weir area. Children evacuated with their entire schools, as well as families who headed west to an area with which they were already familiar through family holidays. Our third story concerns one of those families, though their move to Cumbria opened up a whole new life that has left a lasting legacy. And I'm going to switch off uh, the PowerPoint now and try to switch over to Jeremy's story on the video. So please bear with me for two seconds. I was born in Sunderland in 1931, lived there until in 1940, the Germans started bombing the town and we moved to Appleby in Cumbria to escape the bombing. But first let me tell a bit about my family. Both my parents were immigrants. My father, Joseph Louis Topaz, was born in Bityevsk in Belarus. When he was two years old, his father brought the family to England. Eventually they settled in Sunderland and my grandfather opened a furniture factory. My father was studying to become an architect when my grandfather suddenly died and dad had to take over management of the factory. He had a partner, one Stanley Goldberg. My mother, Rose Brewer, was born in South Africa. Her father came to Sunderland from Kritinga in Lithuania, as did many of the Jews in Sunderland. He tried his luck for a while in South Africa, but when my mother was five, they came back to Sunderland. Dad's hobby was photography, especially portraits. He built a studio in the attic of our house and equipped it with the sophisticated lighting which he built himself. He had photos exhibited in various events and was also a member of the Stereo Photographic Club. In 1940, we rented this house in Appleby. At first, Dad continued living in Sunderland but came to Appleby at the weekends. He showed some of his photos to the local chemist, uh, who was so impressed that he suggested to Daddy send, set up a studio in Appleby 
and offered him space in the uh, warehouse behind his shop for the studio and the dark room. Meanwhile, getting material for furniture production got more and more difficult. And at some point, he sold his share of the factory to Goldberg and came to settle in Appleby with us. So he turned his hobby into a profession. There was quite a demand for pictures to send soldiers and distant relatives. At some point, Dad thought he should join the war effort and went to the recruiting office in Carlisle to volunteer for the army. But they told him that photographers were considered an essential service. I went to school in Appleby Grammar School. There was also a school from South Shields, which was evacuated in total to Appleby. And one of the teachers, uh, Arnold Joseph, was Jewish. He lived in Appleby with his wife and daughter. And our families became very friendly, going for walks together in the countryside. There was one other Jewish connection that I know of, a Jewish dentist who had converted to Christianity. We did go to Sunderland for Chagim holiday, and on some of those occasions, the Germans welcomed us with bombs, and we had to sit under the stairs as we didn't have a bomb shelter. We also went to Sunderland for my bar mitzvah, but by that time, there were no raids. There was a Jewish teacher living in Penrith, who helped prepare me for my bar mitzvah, but I lost contact with him. I don't even remember his name. During those years, we made quite a lot of trips in the Lake District. Dad always came with a camera. He built up a collection of photos and at some point had the idea of making view postcards for sale, for which there was a great demand. He started by offering them to the local shops and later to other places. I'm very proud of his contribution to tourism in the Lake district. My niece and I have collected between us some 100 of the postcards, and Trish Skinner also has a few more. The studio at the back of the chemist shop was rather hidden, and he decided to move the shop and studio to Penrith some 12 miles away. He got a shop in Little Dockery in the centre of town, and the adjacent shop for my mother to sell artificial flowers. When the war ended, we had to vacate the house we had rented in Appleby and we bought a house in Penrith. I transferred to Penrith Queen Elizabeth Grammar School in the sixth form. I heard from some pupils rather nasty anti-Semitic remarks. I soon discovered that the source was the chemistry teacher who told them things like, the only good thing Hitler did was what he did to the Jews. In my first lesson in his class, he said something against Jews, so I stood up and said, Mr. Hargreaves, you should know that I am Jewish. He never dared to, dared to make another remark in that vein, at least not when I was in class. In Penrith, there was a Jewish family from Newcastle, the Bursons. Their daughter was older than I and was working for one of the local newspapers. There was a Czech couple who had escaped the Nazis and wanted nothing to do with Jews or Judaism. One more thing, one of our neighbors in Rehovot, Miriam Vardy, now deceased, told us that she had spent the war years in Kendall, which is also in Cumbria. I'm going to give the last word to Lisa, talking about another uh, refugee. And these are her words. I followed the story of Leo Lewison, who left Nazi Germany right before the outbreak of World War II and discovered his family records from Germany. He reached the UK at a late age with a young child of his whilst leaving his wife, Amelie Castle Lowenson, behind in Breslau. Records from Yad Vashem stated that his wife was killed in Auschwitz in 1942. Lisa says, so far my research had been exciting, interesting, and made me curious to learn firsthand from history. Yet the death of Leo's wife brought confusing emotions from anger to frustration and sadness. Did Leo's wife have a choice to leave Germany? Why did he not take her with him? No matter what we find in the historic records, we do not understand individual decision making. And this is why it's been such a privilege to work on and hear firsthand some of the travellers' tales from Cumbria and to realise that heritage has its dark spaces as well as uplifting tales. Thank you. Patricia, thank you for that. Um, very interesting. And I'm particularly pleased that we were able to bring in some oral history as well. And I guess that there are more stories to be told. Um, I know I've been working with Lisa, uh, particularly about that event that took place 
uh, and did there were, there were several weekends in the Lake District and I, I'll certainly be able to pass that information on. And so uh, we're going to have questions, I think, at the end of the sessions. Um, so we're going to hear from Tiffany now. Um, let me just introduce her. Tiffany is a doctoral candidate in modern European and British history at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Her dissertation explores refugee industrialists who fled Hitler and settled in the special areas of Britain, bringing with them their unique businesses and helping to revitalize Britain's economic black spots. Tiffany's scholarly interests include Jewish history, migration and refugee studies, gender sexuality, imperialism and nationalism. Very impressive, Tiffany. Uh, so we look forward uh, now to hearing from you. Um, over to you, Tiffany. Thank you, David. And thank you all for coming to my talk, but also for welcoming me into your community. I think it will rapidly become apparent that I am not British. And um, I have approached this from an academic standpoint. Um, but I did spend six months last year, right before the pandemic started, backpacking all of these communities and getting to know them. So thank you for welcoming me into your spaces. I would like to start with a story from, an arc, from the Scottish Jewish Archives um, in Glasgow. This is a man who did everything twice. He had two countries, he had two businesses, he had two wives, he had two sets of children, and he enjoyed all of it, Corrine Benjamin recalled of her father, Sally Grabenheimer. She went on to say that her father never seemed bitter or resentful of what he had lost in Germany and only seemed to view Scotland as an opportunity to start his life over at midlife. Grabenheimer was a German Jewish refugee from Dietlsheim who arrived in Glasgow in September of 1939 with a contract from the Scottish industrial estates to open a new millinery factory in order to contribute to solving industrial West Scotland's stubborn unemployment problem. Grabenheimer's visa to settle in Britain was predicated on his industrial acumen and his agreement to participate in this scheme, in this scheme for alleviating unemployment in Britain's so-called special areas, which were legally defined economic black spots in Scotland, West Cumberland, South Wales, and the Northeast Coast that had suffered more than the rest of the country during the Great Depression. Grabenheimer was not alone. Hundreds of what would come to be known as refugee industrialists found their way through the complex and often hostile international immigration bureaucracy to gain permission to leave Nazi-occupied Europe and settle in Britain, provided they work to improve the special areas. This presentation, based on my doctoral thesis research, will examine the ways in which refugee industrialists settled into the special areas and rebuilt both their personal and their professional lives. Refugee industrialists were a unique group of continental and almost entirely Jewish refugees who fled Britain in the 1930s, fled to Britain in the 1930s. Um, while other scholars have occasionally referenced this group, there hasn't yet been a standalone study of all of these people across all of the special areas. Refugee industrialists were only a, a tiny portion, really, of the roughly 80,000 refugees who immigrated to Britain, and they have received considerably less scholarly attention than, say, refugee academics, um, domestic servants, and even the kinder transport. His, um, the historical literature is also heavily focused on refugees who settled in traditional metropolitan centers, such as London, Manchester, Leeds. Um, and I I'm really interested in decentering that narrative and focusing on the experiences of Jewish people, but also refugees in particular in these more far flung and usually rural areas. So in this talk, I'm going to first um, go through how refugees learned of the opportunities in these special areas before moving on to how they actually began to physically rebuild those communities, um, the social and cultural tensions they faced, and then I will conclude with um, how they navigated the hardships of the Second World War. Even as the rest of Britain began to recover from the Great Depression in the latter half of the 1930s, the traditional mining heavy industries regions 
lagged behind. Several government investigations throughout the 1930s found that West Industrial Scotland, the Northeast Coast, West Cumberland, and South Wales were so dependent on mining, iron, textiles, and shipbuilding that they'd been completely unable to diversify and modernize, um, and they could not recover from what was becoming a permanent decline in those industries. A series of legislative efforts defined these four regions as the special areas and began to funnel money into reforming the regions. Most of the funds went towards infrastructure, health and welfare, work, uh, workforce education. And while these things were very much needed, um, very little funding actually went to creating new jobs to reduce unemployment. For example, by mid-1936, when the rest of the country was on its way out of the Great Depression, national unemployment stood at 13.5%, but two thirds of that was in the special areas or Northern Ireland and pockets of unemployment in the special areas could reach upwards of 80%. The biggest solution and problem to this unemployment problem was to entice new businesses and industry to the special areas. This question was also the most perplexing for the investigators. How could a, the government label these areas derelict, depressed, or special, but also still lure businesses to move there? Um, officials recognized that they were hardly selling this industrial project to savvy business owners who wanted profitable ventures, not risky charity schemes. Um, and even with the addition of government um, funded financial incentive, incentives such as tax or rate reductions. Um, and then from mid 1936, new government sponsored trading estates, um, which created modern industrialized, ready built factories, um, complete with full service utilities and infrastructure. British industrialists did not, um, were not interested in these things at all. However, on the other side of the English Channel, a growing number of German Jewish industrialists were beginning to realize and reach the reluctant conclusion that their lives and businesses were in jeopardy if they remained in Hitler's Germany. And I argue that the growing desperation of local officials to attract industrialists to the special areas plus the advantageous terms that the special areas legislation offered, um, offered a prime opportunity to these Jewish industrialists who were being forced out of Germany. For the British managers of trading estates, refugee industrialists were in many ways ideal. They were experienced businessmen. They brought their established manufacturing businesses with pre-existing continental and export connections. Um, in particular, the German refugees were viewed as clever or innovative, going off of nationalized stereotypes of the time. And as conditions in Germany deteriorated, refugees were able to leave with less and less of their belongings and capital. So these trading estates like Tree Forest up here on the screen um, were essential. They provided ready-built factories that were brand new. They were modern. They had all of the utilities and connections but they also had the assistance of local business leaders and industrialists who knew the area and could help um, immigrant refugee industrialists adapt and survive. Other than the condition that they establish a factory in the special areas, refugee industrialists were given the freedom of choosing their new homes. For most refugee industrialists, practical concerns about where their business would flourish drove their decisions. Many considered all four special areas, started negotiations with all of the different development councils um, and only made a decision when one trading estate offered more compelling inducements and financial help. Other refugees um, to whom all four of these areas were daunting foreign lands, um, less practical concerns influenced their decision-making. Sally Grobenheimer, who we started this story with, visited all four special areas and picked Glasgow because it was sunny on the day of his visit. It's not clear if he took this as an auspicious omen or if the city just looked more beautiful on a gorgeous summer day. Um, Francis Frenzel of Lakeland Food Products in Maryport, Cumbria, um, chose Cumberland because he was warned, if you go to Wales, you won't understand a word that they're saying. Still, it seems that most refugees made their decisions based on business concerns, such as Richard Allendorf and Ernest Schweitzer, 
they chose the Northeast Coast because it had the best sand for their concrete factory. Andrew Vigeny, um, who was a Hungarian refugee, chose Milam in Cumberland because it had an ample water supply for his leather tannery. Once the practicalities of physically immigrating and finding new homes and establishing their new lives were in hand, how did refugee industrialists begin rebuilding or participating in their new communities? I argue that the process of acculturation was highly gendered and driven by socioeconomic concerns around maintaining their former lifestyles. While most men recalled their migration as a function of work, and threw themselves into the business aspect of their move, their families experienced immigration differently. People who were children at the time often reflected on the excitement and the adventure of the move, but adult women in particular tended to experience significant anxiety, isolation, and depression. For some refugees, like Sally Grabenheimer, um, Britain offered a chance to rebuild and replace everything he had lost to the Nazis. Hungarian refugee Nicholas Seckers, who settled in Cumbria, believed that Britain offered him what Hungary never could, the opportunity to actually own his own factory, which was forbidden under anti-Semitic laws in Hungary. Others, like the Mai family from Berlin, approached their new lives with a sense of anxiety about maintaining some semblance of their old lives and identities after having lost so much. The search for housing illuminated refugees' expect expectations and hopes for their new lives, and the threat of compromise highlighted their fears of losing social position, respectability, and their sense of identity. A great many of the refugee industrialists came from the prosperous upper middle classes of cosmopolitan Berlin, Vienna, Prague, and they hoped to continue affluent social lives in Britain. The Mai family in particular was worried about their transition from Berlin to Maryport, a small coal mining village of less than 10,000 people on England's Northwest rural coast. And this obviously offered a much different lifestyle than the Mai's were accustomed to. To ease their transition and to allow him to focus on work and setting up the new factory, Baruch Mai wanted a, um, a very middle-class home waiting for his, him and his wife, Betty, and their 10-year-old daughter, Erica. He actually somehow managed to smuggle two vans of furniture out of his Berlin home and send them on ahead. And he got his new British business partners to start searching for a new suitable middle-class home for them. And he gave them very specific instructions on what he was looking for. His British business partners found a very nice new built modern house in Selby Terrace. It had two reception rooms, three bedrooms, um, indoor plumbing, and they were sure that this would satisfy Mai's needs. However, it, the Mai family never actually took up tenancy in this home. They moved to Maryport in April of 1939, and the 1939 register taken in September of that year shows that the Mai's were living in a boarding house with the Benson family in Senhouse Street in Maryport. While Mai had the funds to purchase a, a home, he refused to do so. Did the Selby Terrace home not live up to his demands? Was this not enough of a middle-class home to him? Um, or did he not see his move as permanent? Did he not want to tie himself through property ownership to Maryport or even Britain? Um, after losing everything in Germany, did property ownership seem too risky? We will probably actually never know. Um, and their housing issues were not resolved quickly. This family actually lived in a series of hotels and boarding houses, like many other refugee industrialists. Early poverty and hardship are a dominant theme in the correspondence from the time and oral histories taken later with refugee industrialists and their families. These reveal a deep anxiety around maintaining their former lifestyles and fears of economic backsliding losing social position, and the loss of anticipated future opportunities for their children. Memories of the early poverty refugee industrialists encountered made a lasting impact on their children. Bob Gregory, the son of Robert Krakauer of Burlington Gloves on the tree forest trading estate, was only a toddler when his family migrated. One of his early, earliest memories is drinking the tomato juice out of a tin of Heinz beans because 
it was all his family could afford. Billy Holden remembered that her family rode their bicycles between their tree forest factory and their Cardiff home, a journey of five miles each way, because they couldn't afford bus fares. While a change in social status and security affected entire families, I argue that refugee women experienced these changes much more viscerally. The move to Britain transformed their, da their daily lives and alienated them from their former identities. It permanently altered the prospects and opportunities open to their children, particularly girls. One example of this is the Vlock family from Brno, Czechoslovakia. Trudy and Ilsa Vlock were the daughters of a successful middle upper class family, and they could have expected to continue their comfortable lifestyle had immigration not impoverished their family. Instead of finishing their educations, perhaps even going on to university, both girls left school as teenagers to help in the family factory at Tree Forest. While it was normal for the boys in the family to work in the family business, most of the girls at this time and of this particular social class would have instead involved themselves in communal life, religious life, charity work, completing their educations. Instead, Trudy, who left school at 13, recalls that the whole family entered the factory and had to quickly learn the machines in order to, quote, just about manage to keep our heads above water, end quote when they established um, mechanical Swiss embroidery on Tree Forest Trading Estate. Trudy remembers none of her family actually had hands-on experience with their machinery. Uh, her father had been on the administrative side of the business in Brunel. And for Hans Vlock, um, the family business remained his daily work. His actual job duties changed, but his vocation didn't change. For his wife and daughters, the family business became their way of life and they entered the production floor in a way that they never would have had they not been forced to immigrate. The Vlock daughters were not unique. Numerous other children of refugee industrialists recalled that due to the lack of funds, the difficulties of adjusting to the British educational system, language issues, um, their dreams of attending university and going on to the professions, in particular were never realized. Des Golton, who was 16 when he arrived in Wales, had planned on going to university to become a doctor, um, but he had to take his A-level exams soon after arriving and he didn't yet know enough English to pass those exams. Even for women who remained first and foremost housewives, immigration to the special areas transformed their daily lives. While refugee industrialist men went to work at the factory daily as they had their entire adult lives, their middle and upper middle class wives found themselves left behind trying to rebuild their households and their families, usually without the aid of servants or domestic help and extended family networks. And this was for the first time in their lives. My survey of refugee industrialist families, which I conducted from the 1939 register, shows that the vast majority of refugee families did not have live-in servants, which was still pretty common for British middle-class families at the time, and as many of them recalled having on the continent. Only four households in the Northeast, six in South Wales, and none in West Cumberland had live-in domestic help. George Shawman remembers his father going off to their tree forest factory every morning while his mother went to work on the family home quote, cleaning, scrubbing, painting, something I am sure she had never done in her life before, end quote. As the family arrived in Britain with only five pounds to their name, they certainly did not have the money to hire help. And for Emma Shonman, left at home while her husband went to work, unable to speak either English or Welsh, and with two small children under the age of five to take care of, with no help, no friends or family nearby, life must have seemed a frighteningly long ways away from their life of some luxury in Vienna. Emma's mother, Pauline, was able to join the family in July of 1939, which likely improved Emma's situation at least. But many refugee families were not as fortunate to have relatives close by to help. And for married women especially, the refugee experience was deeply isolating and unhappy, particularly if they weren't involved in the family business or if they were not religiously observant and sought out a new community via their synagogue or Jewish societies. 
Isolation from a sense of communal life troubled refugee industrialists greatly, and it often impacted the women more severely. The Golden family, for example, Dez's family, um, were from Czechoslovakia, and here they had a large extended family, and Dez's mother, Melania, had many female relatives around her. Dez has lots of memories in his oral histories, talking about his mother and all the aunties in the kitchen, um, making food and preparing for the Sabbath. Um, when the Goltons were forced to flee Czechoslovakia, most of them fled to Britain, but to different places. And out of the family that moved to Wales, only one female relative accompanied them. And Melania suddenly went from having this large, boisterous extended family and deep connections into their um, Jewish community and communal life um, to having her sister-in-law, Helene. And to make matters worse, um, her son Des recalled that the family became much less religiously observant after moving to Wales, um, which further restricted the family's um, social and communal life. Part of this could have been because they were too busy setting up their new factory. However, part of the social isolation stemmed from a lack of welcome that most refugee industrialists recalled feeling from their British Jewish communities. This was particularly prevalent in South Wales, but it occurred across the special areas. Although Glasgow, Newcastle, and Cardiff already had thriving Jewish communities before continental refugees began settling there in the 1930s, incoming refugees struggled to integrate into those communities. Um, Glasgow, for example, was the fourth largest Jewish population in Britain. Newcastle and South Wales, Cardiff, um, at about 3,500 by 1940. Um, West Cumberland only had 78 Jewish residents um, in 1945. Many of those were evacuees, like we heard from, um, from Tricia. Many refugees recalled feeling out of place or even unwelcome in British Jewish circles. And for most, this stemmed from more than just a cultural or linguistic barrier, although those were issues. Refugees and British Jews fundamentally differed on questions of religious observation and identity. Laura Gang Salheimer, who was the daughter of Maurice Salheimer of the J. Jews didn't speak English, and their knowledge of Hebrew varied widely. While lack of English posed a social problem to the strongly Orthodox Cardiff community, the shortcomings in Hebrew pointed to a deeper concern about religiosity. Some of the refugees were practicing Orthodox, but most were reform, as was um, common in particular in Germany. Uh, reform Judaism had made very little headway into Britain at the time. Many of the refugees were also highly secularized. Um, a few had even converted to Christianity. And this deeply upset, in particular, Cardiff's Orthodox Orthodox population, um, but this was a problem across all of the special areas. Uh, Laura Gang Salheimer remembers that their welcome was, quote, less than wholehearted. Ethnic divisions also played a role in the acceptance of incoming refugees. George Shonman remembers that his parents were under the impression that Cardiff's Jewish community felt animosity against the new refugees because they were from Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia while the established community had their roots in the Russian Jewish diaspora of the 19th century. These kinds of tensions occurred wherever Western European Jewish refugees settled. The Jewish Echo, which was Scotland's Jewish weekly newspaper, ran several articles begging each group to shake off their prejudices. Ultimately, however, they placed most of the blame for tensions on the incoming newer refugees, claiming that German Jews uh, had a superiority complex and held anti-Eastern disdain. Many of these refugee industrialists, because of this unwelcome that they felt, went on to help found reform synagogues uh, after the war. Cardiff's um, new reform synagogue in 1848 is one of those examples. The situation in the Northeast special area was a little different compared to Wales, Glasgow, or Cumberland. Um, Historian Louis Olsover claims that 40 Jewish families from Central Europe 
selected the Northeast Special Area because of its strong pre-existing Orthodox community, particularly up here in Gateshead um, with the yeshiva that was established there in 1929. Um, however, I'm not as convinced that um, there were refugees who chose this area because of its strong Orthodox reputation. There were a lot more refugees who chose this area because it did have a wider Jewish community, which made people feel welcome, made them feel assured that they'd have access to kosher butchers, for example, and religious services. Um, more of these decisions were business-based, however. Um, another historian, Herbert Lobel, who was actually a refugee industrialist himself, conducted a bunch of interviews in the 1970s. And he confirmed that while the Orthodox Jewish community was a factor that contributed to people choosing this area. Um, it wasn't as many people as Louis Olsberg, um, Louis Olsberg believed. I also began mapping addresses from the 1939 register and I discovered two separate um, conclaves, enclaves of refugee industrialist settlement, if you will. There is one in Gateshead right here on the left. And um, this one does appear that the more orthodox minded refugees settled close to Gateshead um, for the synagogue and the, the um, yeshiva there. However, the Team Valley Trading Estate where most of them were setting up business was right here. Um, so still business concerns are prominent. There was another enclave of industrial settlement in Jesmond in East Newcastle. Um, and even though there was a synagogue up here, um, these refugees do appear to be more ref uh, reform minded and there does seem to have been some sort of schism between them and the synagogue here. However, I need to do more research into this and confirm that this was really along kind of um, religious lines. Where refugee industrialists felt alienated from British Jewish life, they began to create these new communities, neighborhoods, support networks. And by mapping addresses from the 1939 register, we can see that many families chose to live in the same neighborhoods as other refugees. Um, as discussed earlier, Newcastle and Gateshead in the Northeast had distinct refugee industrialist enclaves. This also happened in South Wales. At least 22 families settled in Whitchurch, which is um, this village to the north of Cardiff Central. Um, this was a perfectly this was a perfect location for many families who had factories at Tree Forest, which is only five miles to the north. Um, it also had a brand new high school opened in 1937, several brand new um, modern neighborhoods. This was likely an up and coming inexpensive yet middle class area where many refugees could, um, that offered stability while refugees rebuilt their lives. Cathedral Road, um, which had a synagogue down here, this little strip right here is Cathedral Road, also was a popular for the more affluent refugees to settle. Um, this was a more expensive area and it had um, one of the only kosher butchers in the area, for example. Um, it does seem the more orthodox refugees settled here. also a couple of settlements further out um, in Merthyr in particular. Family needs, early poverty and instability meant that many families uh, relied on each other and their close knit communities. They often opted to live together with extended family and even their own workers until they became more financially stable. And from mapping addresses in the 1939 register, we can see that extended families living together was extremely common. Out of 45 households in the Northeast, um, 11 of them contained widowed parents or other relatives, usually um, younger unmarried siblings. And in this region, um, five families shared a single family house with other refugee industrialist families. In South Wales, there were 70 refugee households that contained over 80 distinct families. On top of 
those distinct families, 22 of these households had um, other relatives living with them. And it was also common for their key men, their key workers who had emigrated with them from the continent to live with them at first, um, particularly if these workers were single. Um, this meant that these early refugee industrialist households were pretty crowded with multiple families, extended family workers, all living under one roof. Most refugee industries had been established for a year or less when war broke out in September of 1939. For many new businesses, war was catastrophic. It cut off trade with the continent, a major export market. It cut off supply lines for resources and raw materials. And the government immediately instituted a rationing and uh, limitation of supplies order, which limited the raw materials for the factories even further, and then only distributed them to those who were producing war-related goods. The government also began requisitioning factories to convert them over to war production. And many firms, especially on these new trading estates, uh, fell victim to this. For many refugee industrialists, the hard work of immigrating and then reestablishing their businesses completely evaporated overnight. At least three out of the 27 refugee factories on the Teen Valley trading estate were already in serious trouble and facing liquidation um, by the spring of 1940. Some refugee factories with the support and the connections of the trading estates were able to secure government war contracts, which kept their businesses going, but often required them shifting production into a brand new, unfamiliar product. And the incredible adaptability and willingness of refugee industrialists to experiment um, and to engage in figuring out how to produce brand new things saved their businesses. It also meant that they contributed significantly to the Allied war effort. For example, Tree Forest Fashion Novelties, which became Trefano, um, was run by the German Schloss family. Originally, were making ladies' fashion pieces out of leather. They rebranded their production line to make leather belts and pouches for military uniforms. Plastic Fashions, under Felix Schindler and Eden Eisner, shifted from making plastic toiletry goods, um, brushes, things like that, to making plastic airplane components. Despite adapting their work, however, refugee industrialists suffered greatly in the early years of the war. Starting in May 1940, the government interned tens of thousands of German, Austrian, German and Austrian foreign nationals. While internment was meant to focus on the eastern coast closest to the continent and therefore the supposed threat of, of invasion, um, refugee industrialists in all four special areas got caught up in it. Nearly all of the men were interned and all of their families relocated further inland away from the coast. Some were interned for only a few weeks, others for more than a year. And in the next phase of my research that I'm just barely starting, I'm actually mapping the dispersal of these families and their businesses and the reestablishment of refugee industrialist enclaves. So far, I can say that um, families were forced out of Cardiff and further up into the Welsh Valleys, and families were forced off of the Northeast Coast, further inland. We heard from the previous, um, from Trisha's presentation, that families were relocated out of Newcastle and Tyne and Tyneside into Cumbria and that happened to many of these industrialists. Internment obviously created significant problems for these new businesses, and many did not survive the loss of their managers or their owners. Um, often the women left behind tried to carry on the businesses at least until they were re um, relocated or interned. For example, Morga Hoffman and Lily Stern, who were wives of um, the great Northern Knitwear Company directors, were only able to keep their factory in Whitley Bay for a couple of weeks until they were evacuated. Without the company's leadership, um, this company began to fall apart. They couldn't get new orders. And the British employees actually banded together and made a petition to parliament to release their um, bosses so that they wouldn't lose their jobs and the companies go under. In another example, Mrs. Alberti of the Alsco Cardboard Box Company in Tyneside um, ran her company for um, uh, several weeks before she was relocated. 
her, her business was run by a friendly British competitor in her absence. Um, and once she was allowed to return to Tyneside in 1941, she took back the business. However, her husband, William, who was interned, um, had to join the Pioneer Corps in order to escape internment. He was not re reunited with his family or business until he was demobbed in November of 1945. Stories of, like this were very common for refugee industrialist families. A few women were able to move their businesses with them. Most could not. Most had to leave their businesses with British managers um, who were awfully, often brand new to the business, newly trained, and didn't know the ropes. Um, the Albertis were lucky. Their business survived. Many did not. Let's see, a little short on time. I have more examples of internment if you are interested. Um, life after internment was very difficult for most refugees. Many of the men like William Alberti had bartered for their freedom by offering to join the armed services. Many other men returned ill or weakened from their experiences. At least two men in the Northeast died shortly after their release. And the government hard pressed for war production requisitioned their factories while they were gone. Julius Barnett lost his factory to government requisitioning when he was interned. His machinery and goods were stored in seven different facilities while he was gone, and he was never able to regain his pre-war business. He actually died in 1944, probably from a lingering illness from his internment days. But his very resilient, amazing wife was actually able to cobble everything back together and reopen the business in 1945. Um, there is a silver lining to this story. Many of these refugees actually returned to the special areas after their relocation or internment and reset up their businesses. Um, Herbert Lobel, who I mentioned earlier, was a refugee industrialist on the Northeast um, Trading Estate. He interviewed all of the refugee industrialists there and found that out of the 44 pre-war businesses, 31 of them were still going strong in the 1970s. Most of the businesses in South Wales lasted well into the 1950s and 60s. At least two of the factories in West Cumberland became significant international corporations. Many of these businesses thrived in the long run. Um, so to conclude, Refugee industrialists were directed specifically to the special areas as part of this effort to develop and diversify these regions. Integration and acculturation, however, were difficult, um, particularly for reform-minded German-Jewish refugees. Families like the Mice worried about maintaining their former lifestyles, and women like Melania Golton and Emma Schonman struggled without their familial and their communal networks. Um, when refugee industrialists struggled to fit into British communities, they instead opted to create their own, and mapping allows us to see this. Finally, the outbreak of war and internment posed the greatest challenge yet to these refugee industrialists. However, most of them somehow survived these hardships and in the end put down permanent roots into their new communities throughout the special areas. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. That was uh, really extraordinary, the depth of information you were able to bring to us um, in an area that probably many of us had some superficial knowledge and now we've got considerably more. Um, and for those of us who knew the Newcastle, know the Newcastle and Cardiff communities particularly, um, the men and women who helped create the reform communities were, as you have said were very much part of that refugee community. Um, we have one question, um, uh, well at the moment we have Tiffany, um, did you find that any of the families were from the same synagogue back in Germany and gravitated to live near to each other in England and Wales? Perhaps a couple of examples from Bruno. Um, Czechoslovakia. However, I'm still investigating their ties on the continent. Um, I suspect that 
These were families that were kind of loosely connected, kind of part of the same general community. Um, and they heard, oh, hey, so-and-so owns a shoe factory and he's moving to Cumbria. I should follow suit. Um, so I'm not sure if it's like really tight connections or if it's just hearsay, um, but there are examples of that, yes. Um, I'm I was going to sort of bring you into the sort of the the nineteen well the nineteen forties with the Cardiff community, and I'm sure that uh, Stanley can uh, introduce you to uh, some of the stories that they're collecting through the Jewish Historical Association of South Wales, and they are currently um, researching the names on their memorial board and looking for people uh, who are descended from those people in Newcastle. Um, similarly, the reform community was made up, uh, I think it was founded in the mid 1960s, uh, and they're also doing some work through the La Havre project in Newcastle. So there'll be people I'm sure here who know about those projects um, and, and can help you with that information. I indeed know, or knew, should I say, knew some of these people very, very well when I was working for the, because I worked for the reform synagogue. So I got to know not only the people, but their histories and the histories of their communities. Good, so are there other people who have questions? If you, probably best if you unmute yourself so we can hear, if you can do that. Jane Warner, and thank you. Hello, that was amazing. Um, what drew your interest to do this doctoral work? I mean, what, 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 what was the starting spur or, you know, what spurred you on? Well, I, I mean, obviously I'm not British. I'm not actually Jewish either. Um, although I've been doing Jewish, Jewish studies for quite some time. Um, I intended to start with looking at refugee experiences in Scotland, but post-war because Scotland has built up this idea of itself as such a welcoming haven to all refugees. Um, and then it kind of, I found the Jewish Scottish archives at the Garnet Hill Synagogue in Glasgow and just dug into what they had and some of their stories um, and came across people like the Grobenheimers, the Friedlanders, and then discovered that this was kind of all part of an actual scheme um, to save the depressed areas or the special areas. Right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. We've got another question from Patricia. Did you get any sense of any difference between the experiences of those in West Cumbria from the other areas which are much more urbanized? Yes. Um, and I'm still struggling to find the records to follow up on this, um, in particular since West Cumbria didn't have a significant Jewish population. I think more of the refugees who settled there were not Jewish refugees. I found one who was a Catholic political refugee. I did find one Jewish refugee from Hungary. Um, and the experiences of living there most of those refugees actually moved to London after the war. I, I think they probably weren't as satisfied with living in such a, a rural, hard to get to area, particularly in the 1940s, terrible transportation networks. I mean, it takes forever to get there today. Um, <laughs> 80 years ago, it, it, it took a long, long time and they felt isolated way out there. Good. Uh Anybody else got a question for either of our speakers, Patricia or Tiffany? Right. Mind, would you mind if I shared something from the Cumbrian experience that might have, uh, um, I, was, I was really struck by the fact of you using, you know, thinking about the contrasting experiences of the men and women, Tiffany. And I wondered if that actually sheds a different sort of light on why Lisa's 
Leo Lowenstein may or may not have left his wife behind, that he might have gone first and, you know, uh, and was hoping that she would join him eventually. Um, but it's striking that having actually um, ended up in, um, in a village in, called Newton Rainey in Cumbria, that in his later life he moved to Blackburn, and I suspect precisely because there was more of a Jewish life to be had there. Um, and he, he clearly joined some friends from Breslau. Um, Lisa, fortunately, because Lisa is a German speaker, she's been able to go back and look at the records from both sides of this journey. So, um, so I just thought that, you know, it's, it's really striking how our, how our two presentations might well have some fantastic connections to continue with. Definitely. And I was actually wondering about Lisa and Trisha's example of that family separated as well. Um, I found that was extremely common in my research, that the husband would often go ahead under the thought that he was setting up a home and a business to support the family and would bring his wife and children out later. Mm -hmm. um, or particularly um, during and right after Kristallnacht in November of 1938, um, men fled so that they wouldn't end up in Dachau and they didn't know where they were going. So they'd kind of send for their family once they got sort of established. I'm wondering if something like that was going on. Yeah. Patricia, did you have anything to add to that? Um, well, we, uh, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm slightly sort of giving this uh, presentation second as, as a sort of uh, uh, of, of work that, that I've been sort of involved with, but not uh, in the same way that Lisa has. Um, but she was, you know, um, she was very much um, looking for the connections, trying to actually connect the single stories that she was finding. Uh, and of course, you know, in Cumbria, it is a series of, uh, it seems a series of solo stories. And I wonder if I might cheekily bring in Jeremy here, whose video we've, I, I so spectacularly messed up. Um, and, you know, that, that Jeremy too, I think you, you know, when, when we were asking you about, you know, was there any uh, Jewish communal life for you to come to? It was really striking. You went back to Sunderland for your bar mitzvah, is that correct? Jeremy might not be with us anymore. Yes, there was uh, there was no real uh, Jewish uh, community at all in that area, and uh, I'm not sure actually why uh, why my parents didn't uh, find a place uh, which had more of a Jewish community because uh, they were fairly religious, well, not terribly religious, but um, in in Penrith and Appleby there was. Nothing except those one or two people. So uh, that's why we had to go to Sunderland for uh, Hagim and for my bar mitzvah. Good. Well, th thanks, Jeremy. Um, do you remember which synagogue it was? Was it Rye Hope Road in uh, Sunderland? Yes, that was my problem. We lived not far from there before we moved to uh, Appleby. Ah, right, right. That, that was our synagogue, not the other ones. <laughs> not the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be that comment, you have to have Jeremy. Two, two synagogues in every place. Absolutely. That one comment could be a PhD, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Thanks for letting us know that, Jeremy, and 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 adding to our information this uh, this evening. It's uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, our train expert Walter Rothschild has explained that uh, there are some. If you read on the chat, you'll find that there, it wasn't quite so bad, Tiffany, to travel from Cumbria. In fact, it possibly could have been a bit easier by railway in the 1940s and 50s before the beaching, um, uh, Dr. Beaching sort of cut lots of the branch lines and everything uh, and lines that sort of overlap with each other as well. Um, but that's another story. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Walter Rothschild, who is an expert on railways, uh, particularly the railways of Israel and, and Palestine as well. Um, I don't know whether he still does, but I think he used to edit a, um, a journal called Harakevet, 
the Hebrew for railway. He still does. Oh, he still. Oh, Jeremy, very I, good. Thank you very much. I have Jeremy. a website on that. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I, I, he reminded me that we used to travel by the L and the R line from uh, Appleby and later from Penrith to uh, the northeast. Right. And uh, that it doesn't exist. It doesn't run anymore, but uh, it did in those days. Right. Well, judging by what our prime minister said yesterday, maybe some of the new these old lines will be reopened uh, to make travel uh, easier, particularly outside uh, outside London. Um, good. Uh, well, let me just remind you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there may well be some more questions. Let me just remind you what we have tomorrow. Uh, the early morning session, 10.30 to 11.30, is Jewish Arts and Culture, uh, Jewish Renaissance and 20 Years of Jewish Culture. Uh, Jewish Renaissance being uh, one of our cultural journals. And in the evening, in this same slot, what you find not leaving a stone unturned reconstructing the biography of Shlomo Rebbe Perlman um, and we're going to hear from Rachel Lewis and David Perlman from Connecting Small Histories and the second piece will be the Hidden Treasures Project and Heirlooms from Dawn Waterman um, who is a member of staff of the Board of Deputies. So I'm just seeing if there's any further questions. Just see anybody trying to put your thumb up or finger up if you wanted to ask a question. Um, I have a I have a question for oh, you, Patricia. Please yeah. go ahead. Sorry, um, I think Mark's just put one in the chat. In fact, so I uh, so please do um, go with Mark. Ah, okay. Mark Drucker asked, "How did the Cumbrians get kosher meat?" I found a couple of examples where it was very common for um, people to have it shipped from London. Right. right. However, I also found examples where they would get a train load of spoiled meat. Right. Right. We didn't. <laughs> we, we lived on low no kosher meat on the train. But also, uh, um, they used to have an arrangement with the local non-Jewish butcher. They certainly did in Bolton where part of his stall in Bolton Market was the kosher side and the other side was the non-kosher side. And also in uh, several of the small towns, they would have an arrangement, certainly in St. Anne's, um, Mr. Smith, the non-kosher butcher, was given the um, facility to be able to have a small kosher section in his shop. Thank you, Hilary, for that. Always interesting to hear from you about how smaller communities manage their affairs. And indeed, that continues today, not so much the butchers with two sides, but sort of uh, companies now delivering kosher products to people living in small communities away yes. from the major centres. Very much so. Yeah. Good. Right. Well, let me thank all the contributors, particularly Patricia, who was speaking um, on behalf of Lisa and um, our, other, our other speaker, um, Tiffany. And if we can do, I don't know, it's traditional, but a round of applause for them both. Uh, and we look forward to hearing more of the work that you are Oh, to some extent, all involved with because of your interest today. Can I personally thank Ed for helping me on the technical side? And let me wish everybody a good evening. Uh, keep safe and well. And if hopefully all of us, if we are to meet again in such ways, we will have our vaccines um, as soon as possible. Thank so you, I wish David. you a good evening. And uh, thank you again for participating. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.